gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelics Today. It's currently June 4. Kyle and I are recording here. Hi, Kyle. Hey, Joe. Hey, everybody. Hey, so, <laughs> everybody. So, today we're going to talk about psychedelic professionalism. It's a very interesting time in the psychedelic space. Well, perhaps it's been interesting the whole time. But uh, <laughs> things are going on that look quite unprofessional, and I think we could all learn a little bit. Uh, from what you know, professional mental health care looks like, and apply it a little bit to this psychedelic world. What a, what do you, what are your like main thoughts, Kyle, about like what does good professional facilitation look like? Mm, that's a good question, and I think it's like kind of somewhat subjective because this is a new territory, and like I, I guess I kind of want to approach this as more of like more as questions and not really so much as answers because, you know, I, I think there is different approaches that people take in this realm, and I think it's just kind of like it's good to talk about it and see how to approach people. But I think the main thing is like obviously approaching this work by doing no harm to people and um, providing some sort of consent um, about the work that's being done. Uh, you know, I think we already had a little conversation. We put it up on our uh, on our YouTube channel about consent and ethic, ethics. And, I, you know, I think that's kind of like a huge part of maybe doing this work um, is with ethics and, and some sort of consent. Um, but yeah, and you know, there's, there's so many different ways to approach this work. I mean, some people are taking more of a shamanic route. Other people are taking more of a clinical route. And when, you know, you asked me that I've working in the mental health field, you know, I've seen some things that were kind of questionable. So even, uh, integrating my experience from there, you know, it, it happens in every field really. Um, even with all the ethics and boundaries and this and that, like things happen in every field. But I think it's just important to raise questions and just have a conversation about it. It's an interesting point. You know, yes, the mental health care field has subpar stuff happening too. So for instance, um, you know, giving somebody a drug like ketamine to take home with no context and using kind of recreational words around it which is something we talked about recently offline. Um, you know, that's a big deal and that's in a clinical setting. So, you know, if someone had an addictive uh, past, like struggling with addiction in their past, then, you know, perhaps that's not okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I know some psychiatrists that are not all that with it. Um, so, you know, not every psychiatrist, unfortunately, is going to be Stan Groff or like <laughs> <laughs> somebody who has this like... Uh, incredible skill with people not just like all right let's put you on a higher dose of benzos this month like um it's kind of a little bit off track but you know there, there there's different kind of psychiatrists too and therapists so mm -hmm. i think in a similar way there maybe we need some sort of segmentation in the psychedelic field because there there's a lot of conflict right now mm -hmm. um people are you know saying i'm the best facilitator because i do this shamanic stuff but perhaps they're not forthright with the shamanic stuff they're um, going to do, which is a big issue with consent. So well, I think, you know, and, and you've brought that up a few times of if you are going to do that work, at least be upfront and honest about it. So we had somebody mention something to us about going to see, say, a shamanic practitioner, but then halfway through the session, they were talking about like, uh, doing more sexual things and you know this person bringing in kind of like some sexual work into the work as the session was already beginning and it's like you know maybe that's something that like you outline beforehand before the session <laughs> begins so it's not as like whoa what's going on now like i don't think i signed up for this um right the way <laughs> the scary way that went down was like you show up and you like you know travel a far distance to go do this session with somebody and you're like, yep, I do all this work. I also do BDSM facilitation to really, you know, work with people's sexual problem problems. And I'm like, okay, that that's a red flag right off the bat. Like if the facilitator like starts saying stuff like that, you know, maybe they need to be a little bit more context aware. Like this person isn't from your city where it's not as normal of a thing. So, you know, that <laughs> it's pretty gnarly. And, you know, um, 
talking about touching that person in a very sensitive area to see if they were relaxed. I'm like, that's not good. That's, that's really pretty fucked up. So, you know, as a facilitator, really take that stuff carefully, maybe segment your own practice. Like if someone's coming to you for psychedelic work and that's what you've discussed, don't, don't mix signals here. You can make people very uncomfortable. Some people are very traumatized, including sexual traumas. So, you know, be really careful. Probably don't talk about that mm-hmm. unless that's like your upfront offering. I'm here to do tantric, psychedelic health work. But, you know, maybe even that person is too traumatized to make good decisions around that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I guess like what's coming up for me is like when you asked about like, per- like overall professionalism. Yeah, I guess I really come back to, you know, people that are doing this work, like, how you approach it, whether it's clinical, shamanic, or maybe kind of new agey, whatever that is, I think the most important thing is being honest with yourself about that work and being upfront with the participants or clients or people that you work with about your approach. So, you know, maybe having some sort of like informed consent um, document, just being honest about these are the techniques that I use. This is like what to expect. This is like, some interventions that I could use, um, you know, and here's where like, um, <clears throat> what do I want to say? Like where things might not work, you know, you might come for, to me for a specific thing, but I might not be able to deal that. So like, you know, realizing your limitations, that's what I was trying to think about. So, um, yeah, outlining those limitations and also kind of uh, being honest about where your scope of practice is, you know. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I The recent uh, Michael Pollan book, uh, I'm going to screw up the title, How to Change Your Mind, maybe? Yes. Um, <laughs> had yeah, a, had a couple kid, sections. <laughs> yeah, the Don Latin book. Don, Don will have some words about that later, I'm sure. So um, it, it references that there is a number of underground guides working online previously to develop all sorts of um, documentation that you could provide your patient or client ahead of time to you know, get ahead of a lot of these issues and to protect yourself from legal issues in, in some ways. You know, obviously, working illegally, you're going to have a lot of problems. Um, if, if something went awry or the person chose to sue you. So, you know, having a lot of documents signed ahead of time could really help. Um, you know, maybe, maybe a standard practice would be having all of your clients go to their primary physician to get a physical, Mm. um, before (laughs) a physical and a verbal approval from the physician. Am I okay to do MDMA? Am I okay to do acid? You know, that kind of stuff. Like, and if they don't know the drug, maybe you have to inform them. Like, I'm planning to do this drug. Here's some papers that I printed out for you for you to review, and you can get back to me. And, you know, if they're saying no, maybe you as the patient or facilitator have to go like, hey, this guy's going to do it, and he needs your input um, and, and reasoned rationale for it, you know. Um, for instance, like, I'm on chemotherapy. Should I do combo? You know, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, and a question we have to ask, like, is it, is it safe? Is it something we should do? And, you know, you as the practitioner, you have a lot of responsibility and you, you really have to be asking yourself a lot of questions about this. Yeah. 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 It's, um, interesting territory cause this is so new to a lot of people and, it's like, yeah, how how are we navigating this and how are we having conversations about it? Because I know recently, like, things, you know, just, I guess, from being online, seeing some things that happened during the Exploring Psychedelics Conference over in Oregon, it seemed like there was a huge conversation about facilitation in the 5-MEO world, about best practices, what's not working, and, um, you know, yeah, it, I, which I'm glad that that conversation came up, but it also seemed like it stirred a lot of different emotions up within that community and um, from that conference as well. And there's a great, a great article um, by Cody from Silly Rabbits podcast. He kind of outlined what happened there. 
Yeah, a lot of swearing, a lot of heated emotions, and you know it's worth it's worth reading Cody's article. Hopefully, we'll remember to link to it in the show notes here. But yeah, man. So a lot of this comes down to consent and weird practices. Like if you're doing something shamanic, meaning you know working with energies or spirits, um, I think you need to be upfront about that. And say, hey, yeah, like you were saying earlier, here are my practices and how I work with spirits. Um, There's, (laughs) all right, I'll lay out four or five practices that I'm seeing out there that that are really messed up, especially if you don't get consent from your patient or client ahead of time. So some facilitators, or at least one out there, I'm not gonna name that facilitator, but vomits on patients. And he is absolutely sure that it's helpful um, for the client. And I don't know if he's getting permission first. He's also one of these people that that smokes um, this special form of DMT uh, with with the patient or client so he can get in tune with that energy. Um, So I think there are, especially when you're one-on-one with somebody like that, I think that's how he's doing it. That's that's kind of uh, crossing a lot of ethical boundaries, especially in this day and age of consent and Me Too and all this stuff. Like it's it's not okay to throw up on somebody. That's a really serious boundary, especially when it's done on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and this person who's under your care, putting their life and mental health in your hands, which mental health is not a it's not a uh, thing we can always count on. Our, Mm -hmm. you know, psyches are frail. They can heal, but they are frail things. And if you do something messed up like that, it could really hurt the person for a long time. Um, and there's other folks out there, um, non-consensually putting rape, which is like a super intense tobacco snuff in people's noses when they're high, um, without getting permission ahead of time. There's also like the the taser thing that we've seen videos of online mid facilitation and uh, splashing water on people's faces to cause an involuntary breathing response, choking and breathing response, which without consent, I think is a big deal. And and then there's also, you know, from our training and breath work, people on drugs should be really careful when they're standing. When you're standing, you have a greater chance of hitting your head on something. And that's probably the worst thing that can happen to you in, in most cases, hitting your, falling down and hitting your head or breaking a hip. Like people over 50, well, let's say people over 60, sorry, people over 50. People over 60 have a really serious chance of breaking bones if they fall. Um, so you, you'll see videos of people smoking 5-MeO DMT in a river standing. And, uh, that, that seems really ill advised to me. Like if you were in a safe padded floor environment with like two people to catch that person, maybe, but what if the neck goes limp and you have like a neck injury, you know, there's a lot of room for injury here. And I don't think people are taking physical injury seriously when they're doing that. So end of rant um except for when there's you know kissing sometimes mid-session which is absolutely not okay sexual boundaries have to be maintained in your facilitation space and should be part of your um your forms that you sign ahead of time like there will be no sexual contact between facilitator and patient Mm -hmm. you know i don't know that's a pretty long rant for me but where (laughs) you take anything from that um, well, yeah, something came up cause I don't, you know, we, we just see stuff and I don't necessarily talk to everybody, but I also wonder some of those facilitators, are they giving consent to out or like, what are they really, how are they prepping participants beforehand? <clears throat> are they, I, I don't know. Um, but you know, something else that came up, maybe we could just talk about the way we approach this work in breath work. Cause that seems, um, yeah, like, let's do that. Yeah, because it seems like that's where our specialty is and how we approach the psychedelic work as well um, through that right. It's framework. the Groff model. It's the Groff model, and he's done more LSD psychotherapy than I think anybody alive. So I think there's some serious lessons to learn from that. Yeah. So where Bill do you want to kick that off? I think Bill Richards has some pretty 
heavy experiences too and um oh absolutely sydney cohen might as well but yeah stan groff is definitely up there <laughs> um so when somebody comes to us like obviously we'll do some screening i don't do too much screening um for my shorter sessions um i just maybe and maybe i should you know and this is me reflecting on this and um which I think is an important part of like some sort of professionalism is kind of reflecting and asking questions and checking in with yourself and checking in with others. But, you know, typically we do some sort of health screening um, for emotional and physical health. And um, I actually created some sort of informed consent about what the practice is like, what to expect, um, the tetany, the tingling, and then also like the risks and contradictions. So, you know, before before a, a workshop people have to read that they sign it they give it to me um, I talk about body work so there is a chance that like I will put hands on you during the end of the session um, just to help resolve it and you know that's obviously voluntary people can say no to that they don't need to engage in the body work it's not like a dogma that you have to do it and we're really explicit uh, about saying no like no mm -hmm. is the one word we take very seriously no one stop. stop. Yeah, stop. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we're obviously doing some sort of health screening to make sure people are in, like, a, a healthy state before engaging in this work. Um, some of the stuff we do look for, like I look for, is, like, any recent, like, say, psychiatric issues or hospitalizations. Um, somebody that might be in spiritual emergence or emergency might not be the best time for them to engage in this really deep personal work. Not to say that it wouldn't help, but I think having a container. So like when I was working at the uh, residential home for people with early episode psychosis, I was revisiting a lot of Groff. And I mean, one of his criticisms was, you know, breath work and some of this stuff could be great for people in these states. But I mean, you really need 24 seven care for a few months to really help that resolve and make sure somebody's staying safe because these mm. things can really open people up um so yeah the way like i approach it and it's a little bit different for the longer formats i know like lenny and elizabeth did they, they do phone calls with people beforehand to really make sure um you know to develop that relationship before the retreat starts um and and really doing some sort of assessment <sighs> yeah there's, there's a lot there, man. Like, I think, you know, spending an hour on the phone with somebody, especially if you have some sort of training with assessing people, I think is huge. Like, you know, maybe if you're with an organized group of facilitators, maybe you guys, you know, hire somebody who's good at assessment to say, Hey, what do you think of this recording that we made? Um, and is this person suitable? You know, here's their Here's their health forms. Here's their approval from their physician. Maybe we go there. Like, you know, sometimes we'll turn people away if they're on too many meds. And I think that's a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Like you've got, you know, three different psychiatric meds. That's probably too much for us to want to work with you. Um, it's a little, you know, I don't really know how to put that, but there's something there where um, y you're, you're putting that person at a little more risk especially with their psychiatrist, not necessarily in the know. Um, you know, maybe the trick would be like after two days after the workshop, they have a meeting with their psychiatrist or therapist to like make sure and you follow up with them. But th I think that has to be part of a longer conversation and maybe mm -hmm. that's somebody you're careful around. Um, yeah. Yeah. And because of body work, we have to be super aware of physical injuries. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, honestly, like body work, it's not, it doesn't happen for everybody. Like maybe no. it's only 10% of people each workshop need it or ask for it even. And sometimes nobody asks for it. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, while it is probably one of the more risky aspects of our breathwork practice, um, yeah, it's really not as common as you might think. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we'll try it and it doesn't elicit a response. So you just quit. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, maybe next time. No worries. 
Um, and I think something to mention with that, it's more like a relationship. Um, and Lenny always kind of phrases it as like, you know, they're kind of like experiments. We see what works, see what doesn't work. And if it's not working for you, you just say stop and we move on. Like it's, we don't need to force this on to you. It's not like this thing that we have to do. It's, it's something that you want to engage in to maybe help resolve whatever's in that body and we can explore it together. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a cooperative process of 50, 50 effort. Mm -hmm. So you're pushing half and we're, we're matching your effort too. So it's not like we're, um, yeah, and we'll even ask you, is it okay if I come in and, and try some body work? We'll like sit next to you for a little bit to let you make up your mind. And if you don't want to, it's fine. And, you know, we'll have a dialogue with you if, if we really think you should. And I don't think we're going to push it on you if you say no. So, you know, that, that we try to make it feel as safe as possible and consenting as possible through the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, so, And something yeah. else came up with like, you know, checking in and doing some sort of assessment. And, you know, I think it's important f for any type of facilitator to check in with themselves and to like really ask, like, do you feel comfortable working with this person? Um, you know, because sometimes, you know, the work might be great for somebody, but, you know, maybe you don't feel comfortable working with them for because you don't think like it's within your scope of practice to work with them, you know, Um somebody that might be in somewhat of a spiritual emergence, like maybe I'd feel comfortable with it just because like I've worked with that for a bit. Um, but then other times I'm like, I check in and be like, mm, I just don't know if I could deal with that right now. And, and I, I think I have to set that boundary and saying no to myself <laughs> and that person, which can be hard, you know, cause it's like, we want to open it up and do this work with a lot of people, but it's also like, where's my limitation and what, what, to, how, like, who do I invite in to make this space feel safe for everybody and myself? So I'm not harming this person. Yeah, absolutely. Like, are you in a good spot to be doing it? Do you have teammates that can fill in where you're feeling lacking? Um, should you be providing aftercare services? Like, are you capable of it with the training and whatever that looks like? in your opinion, um, there's a lot there. Uh, and you know, think about it like where, how can you serve your customer best? Like treat them like a customer. You want them to come back hopefully, and you want them to get as much benefit as possible from your services. Like you're selling somebody car tires. You don't really want to sell them like the $20 car tire that <laughs> could kill them, <laughs> you know, brand new on the market from China, $20. Like, is it really, in your best interest or theirs to have them on very cheap tires that could just cause a hydroplaning accident. Like, no, like same thing with psychedelics. Like you, you should theoretically be charging enough so that you can afford to provide those services if you're able to, mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe you package it in like you, you have like a hundred dollars set aside that you send to somebody who's good at aftercare services or, pre-care services honestly mm -hmm. preparation you know i that's kind of one of the cool things about our class navigating psychedelics is that um it looks like a number of facilitators are going to start selling that to um for us and and they'll get a cut and what that does is lets them have a more informed client going into a lot of this work um and understanding a little bit more about integration self-care ahead of time which I think is huge or like what could happen in that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Like, you know, I think sometimes we frame this work as like very healing and transformative and it can be really blissful, but also, you know, really highlighting the risks and like maybe the limitations there of like, you know, this could bring out things that maybe you're not ready to deal with, or, you know, maybe it could exacerbate some symptoms. Uh, yeah, and just being honest about that, I think it's really important. I think sometimes we get really um, optimistic and really like energized with this work because it's so exciting. And like, we've obviously seen some benefit in our own lives or just the people that we work with, but then also just pulling back. And I think like a big part of 
like I guess that professionalism thing is like practicing a lot of self-care and a lot of self-reflection and maybe having a group to check in with and kind of using it as like a, a sounding board or mirror. It's like, okay, where, where am I at right now? <clears throat> like, I think I mentioned this in our ethics and consent video that we made that, you know, when I was working in residential, I really had to pull back from actually offering workshops. Like I was not in the space to hold space for other people um, which was really hard because it was like I really just wanted to like my workshops were taking off people are interested in it and like I had to pull back and say I'm dealing with such heavy stuff like at work like I really cannot hold space for um, people doing breath work and accessing like those transformative experiences when you know, I have to go into work and deal with this stuff for 12 hours a day and <laughs> sit with it and, and deal with all the politics or this and that. So, and that was really hard for me to do, to make that decision. Um, and, you know, I still even do that now where I'm like, okay, where's my energy at? Um, in grad school, doing this podcast, like there's so much of me that just wants to get out there and do more workshops, do more workshops. But then, you know, I, I do a lot of self-reflection where it's just like, mm, like, am I going to show up with like enough energy for these people when like I have all these papers to write or I got this to do and or, you know, I got to work on this capstone project. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, I, I kind of have to, um, pump the brakes a little bit which is really hard to do because I get so excited about this stuff and every time things get going I'm like okay more 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 and then I have to say okay I also have to practice my own self-care so I'm not not showing up for these people when I schedule an event yeah and I I wonder how many people in the psychedelic space are actually taking a moment to do that I think a lot of people unfortunately put themselves in a financial position where they need to be doing workshops and they need to be giving people psychedelics. And I, I want people to be really careful about that. I know it sounds like I'm coming from a place of privilege, but I'm sorry. Like, you know, you have to consider the health of the whole movement and your patients and clients. It's not just about your bank account. It's about your outcomes and, you are an ambassador for the psychedelic movement, however you want to put that thing. Is it a shamanic movement? Is it just neuroscience? Like, you know, be careful. There, are, there is some extremely valid stuff happening from the atheistic side of this stuff. You know, Robin Carhart Harris's work is obviously really important, and he's a pretty serious um, materialistic Freudian. And, you know, thank God we have diversity in the movement. Otherwise, we'd have less cool ideas. Um, so I don't know, like checking in. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't really available over the last year to be doing many workshops. Like I, my mental state, like stress, like I'm recovering from a lot of injuries and surgery. Like I, I just wasn't there to be able to do it. Like I like to think that I can just push through things, but I think it creates a subpar experience for people. And um, yeah, as a result, I've stepped back a little bit and it's given me a lot of... Uh, room to kind of heal and rest up a little bit and you know that's why i think we were able to do so well in jamaica from our opinion our mm -hmm. point of view like you know because we were kind of taking care of ourselves and prepping for it um yeah so let's see here yeah which comes you know, back to like i'm th i'm reflecting on like breath work and our training there mm -hmm. it's like you know part of part of doing that work is also showing up and doing your work like part of the uh training yeah. is diving in and doing breath work sessions um and doing that stuff to practice self-care and to clear out your own stuff and taking time in between as well just not continuing to dive in and, and do the work but also yeah it takes some downtime to integrate and to sit with the experience and, and all that right so what i what i've noticed is that the people that overuse the most um, are often facilitators. So like some of the bigger names that um, have issues right now out there in psychedelic land, um, like the common core problem could be that they're overusing. So some people are smoking 5-MeO-DMT with every single patient. And that's sometimes, I think multiple times a day, which is far too much for you to have a normal brain that can interact with people on a normal level um 
some people might disagree with me there, but psychedelic overuse is, a, is definitely a real problem and, and historical precedents ha- are there. We can look at Charles Manson. We can look at Jim Jones. There's, there's tons of others. You know, I, I love Tim Leary, but in a sense, Tim Leary too. Um, you know, his overuse probably caused him a lot of problems and, and he could have been possibly more effective than he was if he was using slightly less. I, I don't know if that's true or not. That's just a guess. But, you know, we, we do know that overuse breeds personality issues and, and you know, stuff like inflation, mania, um, stuff that looks like bipolar. Are there any other symptoms you're aware of from overuse that you... I mean, I guess, like, part... Eh, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess, like, overuse, like, you know, I, I definitely have seen, like, friends and people constantly doing this stuff, like, yeah, kind of turn manic, could turn into, like, spiritual emergence, um, or it could just turn into a lot of spiritual bypassing, um, like, not, like, doing doing the work, but also not taking the time to do the actual work in person, you know, you can do the work psychologically and energetically to clear it out in your body, but then, like, are you going back and dealing with what's in front of you? Um, I think there's a difference there. I spent so much time working on the energetic level, but then when it comes to, like, real-life stuff, it's like, oh, man, that is so difficult. Um, right, like, how do your relationships look with your parents, your friends, your coworkers, your spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever? You know, like, how do you treat a dog? Yeah, You know, like those are good mirrors for you. I had this idea recently for like a personal scorecard for people to like kind of track improvements in relationships and, you know, quality of life. Like, you know, like uh, how often are you working out? How well are you eating? Like (laughs) how often do you get really, really, really angry? Like are you getting super angry five times a day? Maybe with some conscious attention, you could move that down to once a day or none maybe it's like twice a week or three times a week you know that's a huge improvement like feeling angry isn't the best Mm -mm. it's kind of like a sister of fear in a lot of ways Mm. like what are you afraid of and like have you really analyzed that not sure Mm -hmm. you know think think about it yeah i think about like a lot of my breath worker say past psychedelic experiences it was always like family stuff would come up and it's like well did i ever pick up the phone to call them to talk about some of this stuff no but i'll just go back and think i'll clear it out like in that energetic spiritual somatic realm and and everything will be fine but then you know you show up and you're like hmm okay yeah i still haven't called that person (laughs) or or done any of the real work in there so um you know and that's what i've been really working on in the past like two years it's like okay i've done a lot of that so now how am i showing up in real life to approach that so it's not continuing to show up in in that psychic psychedelic space you know my ayahuasca session i had years ago pretty much the end of it was like recover your you know do your best on your family relationships repair your family relationships and you know nothing was really that bad there just wasn't a lot of time spent working on those things Mm -hmm. and you know maybe i took it too far in the other direction but i think it's in a good place right now and you know it's only taken 10 years or something so (laughs) you know some of these projects aren't going to be easy too yeah you know and going back to ayahuasca isn't necessarily going to fix it or whatever you know you have to do some things sometimes get your life in order a little bit and um yeah hopefully that doesn't sound too much like peterson but you know a lot of what psychedelics are telling you to do is like get your shit together a little bit like get the help you need do the things you need to do and you know cultivate a improved lifestyle yourself and and better relationships often it's about relationships and Mm self-care i don't know hopefully i'm not going too far astray here but (laughs) no no i think we're within that area of taking care of yourself when you're showing up to do this work something came up um when you mentioned like paying bills and something always pops up in my head um you know studying shamanism for a bit and studying with a shamanic practitioner and you know, something that Lenny always would say, he's like, when he would refer to like maybe Michael Harner's work or whatnot, he's like, you know, shamanism's a part-time job, um, but it seems like in capitalistic society, it's also a means to develop a career. 
Um, and then I guess I always come back to like, you know, it is energetically taxing and, um, you know, do you want to be doing this work full time? Um, sometimes I like it. Other times I'm like, no, like part time sounds good. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it, it can be pretty draining. Um, yeah. You know, we, one idea that I like to keep bringing up is this whole permaculture commune idea, like as far out and hippie as that sounds. Like maybe you could do it in the city in a bigger building, but you share responsibilities and you're a shamanic collective doing the work. Maybe you have one day a week where you do the work and everybody shares that responsibility and you just take care of the other mundane stuff. And, you know, you're living this conscious shamanic lifestyle theoretically. I don't, you know, I'm just kind of going out in left field a little bit here, but there's, I'm trying to say there's ways to do this. Um, so you have a lifestyle that's in alignment with your, with your beliefs or whatever experience. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And keep each other in check a little bit by being close to somebody. You're, you're, you're more prone to have frank discussions with each other about what you or they might be doing wrong or could improve on or something. Yeah. Um, another thing that just popped up, something my teacher said to me one time when I was working with people with early episode psychosis, it, was, it just felt very draining. And you know, I had an incident that felt kind of paranormal. And like I went to him for some healing. And it, I think it, this comes back to maybe like power and ego. Um, maybe healers don't always want to go get healed by somebody. But the one time I just felt like so drained and I just was having like all these headaches all of a sudden. And, and, you know, I went up to do some healing work with him and he's like, yeah, you know, we all get zapped every once in a while and that's why we're here. Like, we really need to, like, rely on each other. He's like, I get zapped sometimes too working with patients and, like, I have to go see my healer and, and, and you know, get, get energetically because it's something I can't clear. And I think, like, being real with ourselves and, and finding other supports and other people to work with is really important. Um, you know, it's like training to be a therapist. Like I need to go get my own therapy and having somebody else check me out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like you hear in a lot of the ayahuasca circles about like dark shamanism often. And you know, some of this stuff is intentional, but if you're dealing with transpersonal stuff and serious energies from people like that's you know probably a real thing you, you can look at a talk therapist who does uh i don't know do you think some therapists are doing like seven sessions a day with patients how many seven like seven probably yeah that's so much like I, I was thinking about the toll that would take on an individual and i think that's insane like that the level of burden you're taking on from all these intense stories like that's a lot Mm -hmm. But um, you amplify that in the shamanic space quite a bit or the psychedelic space quite a bit. And yeah, like maybe you're only able to handle two patients a week, you know, if you're doing one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Because there is a lot of like stuff bouncing around and like transference projection is, is definitely a real thing. Counter projection, like all that stuff takes a huge toll on you. Like and I was especially tired after Jamaica. Yeah, especially when you're working in those non-ordinary states. Um yeah, I was pretty drained too. Like I went home and probably like, you know, those two days afterwards, I definitely slept a lot to clear, clear some stuff out. Um, and you know, like I think also if you believe in some sort of like protection or clearing thing, you know, sometimes I wear like a little, um, medicine bag necklace, um, just to, you know, it's kind of like a, just a little safety thing for myself. <laughs> Um, which makes me just feel comfortable and who knows, maybe that's superstitious, but you know, I think having some of those little items or things that help you with, um, protecting your energy and, you know, sometimes it just comes down to setting boundaries and saying no to things, which is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Do more by doing less. Um, which is one of the fundamental things that we talk about in breath work is, you know, it's, it's this art of not doing. Mm -hmm. You always have this impulse like, oh, should I go touch? Should I go check in with that person at like an hour or two hours in? And, you know, the answer is typically no. Like unless they look like they're in physical harm. No. Um, wait till their eyes are open and they look at you or something before you go even near them. And even in that case, don't say anything first. Like maybe 
wait for them to say something. You know, there's a, there's an art to this that we haven't fully fleshed out yet as a culture, as a species. Like this is, again, it's been illegal for decades and we're, we're still learning, but I, I think there is some extreme value in, in what's been, um, uncovered by Groff and others. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, holotropic breathwork is an incredible model to train and to do well with psychedelic therapy. Like in a mm -hmm. lot of ways, Groff, the Groffs designed this as like cover for psychedelic training. Um, GTT today might not agree. It's kind of outside of their purview, but um, GTT being Groff Transpersonal Training, the organization that owns the trademark to, to holotropic breathwork. For, for those out there who weren't in the know, mm -hmm. um, sorry for using cryptic terms. <laughs> um yeah yeah something just came up but i had a brain fart and can't remember now yeah no worries. Well, it will, it will come back it, oh right so, okay uh the non-directive approach um mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's interesting that you, i feel like we take more of a non-directive approach and I, we probably mentioned this before on the show but you know one story that lenny has told us and you know, some some facilitator thought this person was going through a birth experience and they wanted to go in and help them through that birth process. And then during the sharing, you know, the person was like, yeah, I was like this, this Viking warrior, <laughs> like sailing across the sea. So I think that's why we take more of a non-directive approach because like we really have no idea what's going on with the person. We could like feel that or maybe think, you know, our intuition could say, oh, this is what's going on for a person. But, you know, maybe that's really not what's going on for a person, even if we are very attuned to, you know, those subtle energies or just in tune with people. Um, you know, because I've definitely had sessions where like somebody came over and started maybe doing body work or did something. And I was just like, whoa, like you had no idea what was going on. Like, that's not what I needed at that point. Um, and you know, m is that a great model? Uh, you know, it's definitely up for debate, but I think it's a pretty solid model that we work with. Um, and I think something else when I think about maybe the non-directive approach or like a shamanic approach, um, is maybe like those, the verbalization. Um, so like when I think of maybe like more of a shamanic approach, you got, like the drumming, the rattling, the singing, which is usually in some sort of foreign language, because if you're a Westerner going down to Peru, maybe you don't know the Icarus, Icarus um, in detail. So coming from that breathwork background of like having music to contain the experience, but not having like a language that you're familiar with to bring you out of it. Um, yeah, or popular just, songs that people are familiar with. Like that mm -hmm. seemed to be one of the biggest criticisms I've been hearing lately. Like, you know that song and it put you in a specific spot. But I think uh, people should know that it's, you know, um, we're designing our playlists so that people aren't familiar with the tracks and it's mostly organic music. It's not too digital. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay for it to be digital. It just shouldn't sound overly electronic. Mm -hmm. It should be as like, you know, acoustically broad and sonically wide as possible and yeah foreign languages that hopefully people don't know so these days you know be careful with spanish if you're in the states like a lot of people know spanish um maybe you choose something a little bit more obscure like an indonesian tribal <laughs> language or you know stuff like that yeah and i like to think of it as a sonic envelope it's like a protective thing that you're kind of sitting inside to isolate you from um broader experience i guess mm -hmm. um to isolate yeah. you from the outside world yeah. And I was, I guess I was thinking about like interactions with people and I was just thinking mm -hmm. about like, you know, maybe from that shamanic perspective, like they might be interacting, but it's almost like kind of not in a verbal way. They might just be rattling or blowing over you. And it's more of like an energetic way of moving energy, um, not being like talking to you and like trying to understand what's going on, but rather showing up in a way where it's more maybe nonverbal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I guess the purpose of this episode really is to help you as facilitators or people interested in facilitation maybe um, to think really carefully about how you can provide the best service possible 
how you can protect the movement and yourself. Um, and yeah, maybe it's being, you know, taking into account all these things we've talked about, consent, um, screening, uh, not mixing modalities possibly, or at least being upfront about it in your advertisement before a person's giving you money or something. Uh, cause there's, there, ethics are really hard and even licensed mental health practitioners are doing relatively unethical things or, you know, un things that aren't very tasteful. You know, maybe it's not unethical. It's just not in good style. Like think about what style looks good and what reflects on you. Is it, is it drinking a lot in front of your patients or, you know, smoking a lot of weed, you know, maybe, maybe not depends on a lot of the context. Like is somebody really damaged or is somebody, you know, very functional and, and seems like a very healthy person from all the screening you've done, you know, you have to make decisions and mm -hmm. think about what this looks like long-term for you and for the movement and your place in the movement and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I think I we're, we're, to, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, we're all human. This is still kind of re relatively new in our culture and we're still trying to figure it out. And, you know, we're probably all going to make mistakes and all like learn together. But I think it, like the most important thing is just trying to ask more questions, try and figure out like how we approach this work, check in with each other and um yeah and just be honest like okay okay maybe i maybe i messed up that one time maybe that wasn't the best approach um how could i tweak things and really come back to what is best for the patient or the participant um and how can i best serve them without getting like some of my own beliefs in the way yeah and this isn't for you this isn't for you to feel like a cool magical person this is for the patient to heal like don't don't mix modalities if, if possible and understand like they're paying you to get the best service possible. Like they don't want a half-ass job. They want the best possible thing. So, you know, even consider, are, am I even qualified? You know, maybe, maybe I need to find a mentor or read a bunch more books or something, you know, having yeah. a peer group of practitioners is really important. So maybe seek out other people who are doing this work and, try to come up with like a, you know, a group. Okay. Approach. A group, yeah. Or create approach. your own, create your own group. Um, like I just got Absolutely. a little group email about uh, integration providers, just kind of checking in with each other um, to talk about the, exactly this. I think the topic tonight is about business actually um, and how to market and, and be a professional within this realm, which is kind of ironic. So I, I, I might actually try and tune into that. And also, you know, we're always learning. So, you know, even though you might feel like you understand everything, like go get some more education, like, um, which, you know, whether that's a workshop, a, a little event, or just talking to others, creating a group, you know, I think it's, I think it's important. Yeah. And keep an eye We're we're always going to be developing new online classes that you can jump on and we try to make them affordable. Uh, if you look at how much an actual professional training costs for <laughs> mental health care, like continuing ed credits, it, we're typically a lot cheaper than that. So take, take a look and, you know, maybe you'll get some benefit out of it. And it's not just us. We're leveraging a lot of other people on these things. And, um, yeah, we, we realize that we don't know everything. We think we have a lot of good questions, but you know, there's still a lot of people out there with a ton more expertise than we have. So we're leveraging the whole psychedelic community and what we, who we think are the best of the best out there. And yeah, I, you know, maybe do the same or maybe check out our classes or I don't know. Um, do you have anything more to say about professionalism, Kyle? No, I think, I think we covered, um, covered everything on, but cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just check in with yourselves. That's, I think that's my main point. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a song about that. Um, chiggity check yourself before you wreck yourself, something like that. You know, yes. <laughs> There's there's a lot of room for catastrophe here because it's illegal, because you're putting yourself in harm's way to do what you think is good or right. So don't necessarily be some sort of uh, martyr. You don't have to be a martyr. In fact, we would prefer not to have any martyrs. So, you know, be careful out there and, and protect yourself too. 
yeah. how do you protect yourself legally and be be more selective with the people you're working with in the underground you know there's a lot of things here um to be careful about uh yeah actually so, yeah. um some something that came up um reading michael pollan's book um in the first chapter they're talking about the renaissance and how this is like a wave you know it, it came in in the 60s it ended you know late 70s with spring grove finally um they were they were doing psilocybin research up to i think 77 um and that it's back again and that you know these cycles can continue that we're at this this wave this it, it's coming but you know we could also make a bunch of mistakes so i think everybody in the community it's like i feel like it's a lot about collaboration and checking in with each other and trying to figure out how to not really screw this up um, when i was at a training um somebody said you know stan was like this is like a very like special time that this is coming back again don't fuck it up <laughs> you know like there, we have this opportunity where, who knows, maybe we can integrate psychedelic therapies back into the culture. Um, and yeah, I think we need to approach with a little bit of caution and care. So like, yeah, we, we don't mess it up for people, for our future generations and yeah, the people to come um, after us. Yeah. There's a lot of people who suffered far more than they needed to as a result of the war on drugs. Think about all the people with terminal cancer who could have had their anxiety cut in half or um, yeah, depressions or serious anxiety or OCD that could have been cured in the last 30 years if we were able to use this therapy. So you're, there is a lot at risk here, an enormous amount at risk here. And just because you feel like it's your calling doesn't mean that you should be acting like a cowboy. You should put as much care and intention into this work as possible. And, and you know, be careful, be as skilled as possible, treat it like an art or a craft, like, you know, be like the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, try to become a virtuoso facilitator. Like figure out, you know, maybe go see what other people are doing. Jump in with four or five different other facilitators here and there and, see what you might be able to bring back to your practice that fits into your style. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing that I need to do with breath work is go, go be with more other facilitators. Like I've seen mm -hmm. maybe eight total facilitation styles. And I, I really, uh, I think I'm going to start digging into rebirthing a little bit. It's a different form of breath work from a different tradition, but just to like understand that model and see what maybe I can pull in, um, to my practice a little bit. I know it's not, super in line with the holotropic theory necessarily, but I think there is some fundamental overlap. Um, mm -hmm. All right. I think we beat it to death. <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit, Kyle, about the uh, the classes that we're launching? Yeah. So we have um, some upcoming online classes. Uh, <clears throat> they're... Joe is hosting a four-week class. I'm hosting an eight-week class. So you'll get access to our Navigating Psychedelics, which... Um, all the course material there, integration book, integration journal. And so the, the live classes kind of act as a classroom. So you can go through the course material and then we'll have weekly meetups for an hour and a half on Zoom so we can check in, have a discussion, and just talk about whatever's coming up for it, people, really using it as a classroom time. Um, at least that's how I'm structuring it. I don't know how, what, what's your plan, Joe, for structuring those calls? <laughs> um, I kind of mostly want to see what the, what the class wants. But yep. um, it looks like we're going to do an intro week one, kind of talking about uh, the intentions around it. Uh, class two will be prep and safety, kind of harm reduction stuff. Week three will be more about the psychedelic experience. And uh, week four is about self-care and integration. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, a little shorter than yours, but I think it's going to be really valuable for anybody who can take the time to, to deepen their um, education around this stuff. And it, it comes with the full Navigating Psychedelics class and uh, we're treating it more like class time when we get together. So um, I have the dates if you want me to share those. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. All right, so for my four-week session, it's um, we meet at uh, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. 
uh, weekly. So that would be kind of late for folks on the East, but you know, if you're a night owl, it's cool. <laughs> so June 19 uh, is week one, June 26, week two, July 10 and July 24. So a little bit of space in there in the middle for you to catch up on some of the classes if you're a little behind. And uh, Kyle, for years, I'll just read out the dates here. It's um, June 20, June 27, July 4, July 11. No, July, July 4 18. should be off. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> week three, it says July 4, no online meeting. Good call. Yes. Um, yeah, so July 18, 25, and August 8. So, um, yeah, a little spacing there, which is probably good because there's a lot of content in these classes. Um, I actually, I don't know if I got to tell you this yet, um, but Saturday night in the Red Rocks parking lot, I was going to go, I was heading into this show, and um, somebody in the parking lot uh, was had taken the, the live um, DMTX webinar. Nice. Uh, and knew you. Wasn't familiar with me because I wasn't <laughs> instructing on there. But um, it's like, oh, you know Kyle? I was like, well, very well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's and awesome. What was interesting is like he just wanted to donate money to the research, and then he was like, "Oh, cool! It comes with the class," uh, and he was just shocked at how much information was in that that webinar series. Daniel that put a lot together. One. Yeah, it was four weeks, and Dan. I mean, they were two hour calls, and Daniel put together a lot of stuff for that. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, so um, that guy, you know, hung out with us all night. He actually knows a bunch of my friends. Um, so it was really fun and uh, just a, a funny chance meeting. So, yeah, just imagine what's in this longer uh, navigating psychedelics that you get live support from either Kyle or I. So I, I think there's a lot of benefit there. and It comes with that integration workbook and trip journal. So, um, yeah, I think y'all really dig that. So to learn more, just head over to psychedelicstoday.com and you'll, you'll see some stuff there. Um, mm -hmm. if it's confusing, just click on the shop button and you'll definitely see a place to buy it there if you want to learn more about it. And if you want to learn more and just ask us questions, email us psychedelicstoday email at gmail. Um, we'll be happy to ask, answer your questions and hopefully figure out a way to get you into the class. Yeah, if you want to purchase that course or check it out, the seats are limited. There's 10 seats because we want to keep it kind of small knit kind of learning. Um, go to psychedelicstodayshop.com, click all products up in the navigation menu, and then you should see those two course offerings um, in, in that list there. There's the four week and eight week course. And who knows, maybe we can get some special guests on depending on whose schedule can line up. So last time I had John Harrison, who was one of the principal investigators for the Ibogaine research for, with maps, join us on multiple calls. I had Catherine on there. So, you know, um, hopefully we can get some other other people on there. It's it's a really fun time to learn from one another. Cool, man. And also, I noticed uh, after our last episode, some people picked up the book, the integration um, workbook and trip journal, and and those are available too, like ten bucks each. Can you can you kind of describe what those are for people? Yeah, the trip journal is just like an outline of a little bit of harm reduction, has some like dosing information on there, education, and then it just kind of breaks it down uh, like a little journal on like reporting your trip, what you're taking, your dose, and then just walks you through some journal prompts. Um, and then there's some cool art by this. Uh, we have um, a friend out in Australia that donated some of her uh, hand drawings that you can color in. It's kind of like a little coloring book of mandalas. Um and yeah, so it's just a nice way to track your trips. And then the integration workbook is, I don't know, a crack at trying to figure out what integration is, but it's a lot of different journaling prompts, um, kind of goal setting, figuring out some things to work on, figuring out those different areas in your life. So physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, family, figuring out like where you, what you could work on in those realms. And then, yeah, there's just different journaling prompts. There's like some dream stuff and there, it, there are a lot of different practices that I've just engaged in over the years or I've used like, you know, in mental health settings, but also a lot of it kind of comes from my transpersonal work as well. And yeah, you could get those at the shop. Um, they're PDF, so you can print them out, or you could also use it as a template for your own journal of some sort. Absolutely. And we're working on getting those into hard copy in the future, but um, no timeline on that. 
Yeah. And then, yeah, I also want to say thanks to, there's been a few people that signed up for our Patreon recently. So huge shout out to those folks that um, have donated to our Patreon. Something that we definitely need to start working on some more. So if you want to support the project, you can also donate to Patreon our, our Patreon account. Psychedelics yep, today. As low as a dollar a month. Mm-hmm. And we'd appreciate it. Yeah, and I'm thinking about reorganizing some of those offerings to do a little bit more live meetups and different things like that. So, yeah. all right, well, I'm good. Are you? You think we finished up? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. All right, see you on the other side, everybody. Bye, bye. <laughs>